Thank you, and thank you to ARM for a terrific meeting and the opportunity to present our story. CRISPR Therapeutics, this is our forward-looking statement. We're a publicly traded company as well. CRISPR Therapeutics is a leading gene editing company that is uh, taking the CRISPR-Cas9 technology aggressively forward into transformative therapies for patients. It's our anticipation that among the CRISPR companies that we will be the first to bring a therapy into the clinic, and I'll describe that in a few minutes. We also have an uh, immuno-oncology program that I'll describe as well that is wholly owned, and a number of, uh, of uh, efforts in the area of in vivo programs as well. I'll talk a little bit about our joint venture and our partnerships. One is with Casebia, which is a joint venture with Bayer, and um, we won't have time to get into our strong IP and financial position, but I refer you to our corporate slides, which are on our website. We have a, a strong leadership team. I only put this up here to, um, to share the news that we have a new CEO in Sam Kulkarni. He was previously president of CRISPR Therapeutics and has been promoted to chief executive officer. CRISPR Therapeutics has been focused on our business strategy from the very beginning. The ex vivo approach, that is to say taking cells out of a patient's body, has been the cornerstone of our direct path to the clinic. That avoids the challenges inherent in delivery to the appropriate tissue or target tissues. Um, and I'll talk about our lead to indications there. We are pursuing select in vivo applications, and we have uh, the two major partnerships that we are leveraging uh, in order to both broaden our ability to bring CRISPR-Cas9 therapies to patients and be able to access key technologies that are present in other companies with whom we partnered. In terms of our partnerships, our partnership with Casebia is a joint venture which uh, is now a year and a half old, and it's a 50-50 ownership where we own half of Casebia and Bayer owns half of Casebia with extensive investment into Casebia as a program, uh, as a program area. We've chosen to have Casebia focus on high complexity, high risk reward disease areas, a number of indications in hematology, ophthalmology, cardiology, and other areas. And with this, we also access key strengths in protein engineering, delivery technology, and therapeutic area expertise. In contrast, our partnership with, Bio, with Vertex Therapeutics is more of a traditional uh, licensing deal. However, our lead program in hemoglobinopathies is a co-development, co-commercialization program. We view the process of bringing CRISPR therapeutics into the clinic one of assessing technological complexity or risk. And the reason we've chosen to pursue ex vivo indications is because we want to identify and mitigate areas of risk or technological complexity to give us the best chance to create medicines based on CRISPR. The near-term opportunities are those that are ex vivo, manipulating hematopoietic stem cells for hemoglobinopathies such as beta thalassemia and sickle cell, as well as T-cell-based immuno-oncology programs, and then the proximal, I would say, in vivo indications such as liver. Medium-term opportunities and mid-to-long-term opportunities are those that are progressively more complex and that will take longer to solve some of the associated challenges and reach uh, clinical testing and ultimate uh, uh, creation of, of therapies approved for patients. I had to put this slide in here. Um, all of you know the CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism of action, which is a highly targeted and specific way of making a break in the DNA. And it's really the body's own endogenous repair mechanisms that will either repair that with a sequence disruption shown on the left, or if this is done in the presence of a donor template or a stretch of DNA, will introduce or correct the DNA sequences at that site of, uh, of, of the DNA break. Uh, there are also ways to use a CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism of action for gene regulation. This is a highly specific way of targeting in the DNA so that you can direct your DNA modifications to, to the very site of interest or site of disease. This is based on the guide RNA, which is dire directed by a 20 nucleotide sequence that specifies exactly where in the DNA you want to make the correction or modification. Because it's a modification to the DNA, to nucleic acid, it's a permanent change. 
And the power or strength of CRISPR is in being able to evaluate hundreds or even thousands of places to make modifications in the genome simply by changing the guide RNA portion, which simply requires synthesizing a 100 nucleotide uh, uh, stretch of RNA, it, as indicated here in the guide RNA. It also allows for multiplex editing, as one may want to use in T cell indications. Our current product development pipeline is here, and I'll speak just briefly about our lead indication in sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. These are both diseases of the beta globin protein missing in beta thalassemia and defective in sickle cell anemia, such that under low oxygen conditions, the hemoglobin molecules aggregate into long rods in the red cell and make the red cell stiff and plug up small vessels, causing the symptoms of disease. Both of them are devastating diseases. Both of them have a high burden of patient care and early mortality. Our approach to treating these diseases have to do with the notion that kids with each of these diseases, they're not sick when they're born. And the reason is because all of us have a fetal form of hemoglobin when we're first born. It teaches us that fetal hemoglobin can fully complement the defective or deficient hemoglobin seen in these two diseases. There are rare patients in whom fetal hemoglobin continues to persist well beyond the perinatal or infant period into adulthood. This is called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. This occurs because there are specific modifications or sequence changes or variants in the DNA that disrupt the normal shutting off mechanism of fetal hemoglobin. And our approach is simply to recapitulate what nature has already shown us in this experiment of nature to create a medicine for sickle cell anemia and for beta thalassemia. Shown in these two graphs on the left is sickle cell disease, on the right is beta thalassemia, and the x-axis shows increasing levels of fetal hemoglobin, and on the left it shows that it's associated with a reduction in the number of sickle events, such as aseptic necrosis, stroke, uh, et cetera, and in beta thalassemia, that the morbidity of disease is dramatically reduced with increasing levels of fetal hemoglobin. And for more data on this, I'd refer you to the presentations that we've given at recent medical conferences, which are all on our website. We are on track to file a clinical trial application, a European version of an IND, by the end of the year. We've completed our in vitro proof of concept studies, showing that we can indeed recapitulate this phenomenon of persistent fetal hemoglobin expression. We've completed in, vi in vivo engraftment stu studies showing that these edited cells are not compromised in any way. They're fully able to engraft the mouse model and that this effect lasts. And we've completed our GLP toxicology studies um, that are required for CTA filing. So we are on track to file a clinical trial application by the end of this year. We've also undertaken extensive process development and manufacturing work in this regard. The editing that we do, the modifications, and again, this is in human primary hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, um, is highly efficient. This is the intended modification we will be making with patient samples. And at lab scale, we can perform this at 90% or greater efficiency. And that efficiency is largely maintained when, he, when we go up to the clinical scale in the manufacturing facility. So we're quite encouraged by the progress in this program. The second program in the realm of ex vivo therapies is in CAR-T, or immuno-oncology. Uh, and allo CAR-T is our initial IO cell therapy product. There, are, uh, there have been significant, uh, um, I would say quite dramatic, uh, accomplishments with autologous CAR-T therapies. There are clearly some, a number of patients who've been rendered disease-free with autologous CAR-T therapies, but those therapies also have significant challenges themselves. The opportunity for an allogeneic or off-the-shelf CAR-T product is that one can establish a source and a, uh, uh, a batch, if you will, with consistent potency and safety. And one can also engineer these allo CAR T cells to both have optimal um, characteristics in terms of graft versus host or host versus graft disease. 
and shown here are two data sl slides on the effect of CAR T cells in eliminating uh, tumor cells both in a chimeric antigen receptor dependent and in a target dependent manner. We have presented some of these data and we'll be presenting additional data on our CAR T program in November. The process development and manufacturing for CTX 101, which is our lead CAR T program, has been initiated at Master Cell in Europe. Finally, a brief comment about our in vivo programs. We have established and shown here is a model system and demonstrated highly efficient and effective gene disruption in the liver in vivo. This is a highly expressed serum protein with which we can knock down 80 to 87% reduction with a single dose in this context. And our lead liver programs are proceeding accordingly. We have a number of efforts on the research front to enhance the platform for in vivo applications. We have an extensive collaboration with MIT regarding lipid nanoparticles. We have extensive work in the realm of messenger RNA. And we have work with Stride Bio as our partner developing adeno-associated viruses with improved tissue specificity, reduced immunogenicity, and opportunities for self-inactivation. And additional nuclease engineering in our partnership with Casibia and relationship with Bayer in terms of next generation Cas9 uh, molecules. These are the highlights that I wanted to share with you today. Again, we hope to be the first CRISPR therapeutics company bringing a product into the clinic with the filing of a clinical trial application later this year. Our immuno-oncology programs are making tremendous progress, and those remain wholly owned progress. And we are systematically de-risking, we believe, the in vivo indications. Thank you for your attention.